Yeah, I'm, I'm going to continue where we stopped today and maybe just as a brief reminder where we stopped. Um, so I, I introduced this duality between uh, scattering amplitudes and Wilson loops uh, in ADS-CFT. And actually, maybe it wasn't too clear, but this is, uh, this is clearly a planar duality. So um, for that, you need that the scattering amplitude has a certain color ordering. And, and also this, uh, and, and also only planar contributions are used, and same for the Wilson loop, it's just a planar disk-like object. And, um, and then it's certainly a relevant quantity to understand what, what is this, uh, what is this, I mean, since the, the scattering amplitude is dual to the area um, in this surface, um, it's a relevant quantity to understand what is this surface. Um, so, um, however, it's, it's not easy to, ah, right. So, um, uh, you know, in the strong coupling limit, um, the scattering amplitude is dominated by the surface area of this minimal surface, which ends on the polygon on the boundary. And um, the, the minimal surface area is known for a four-sided polygon. There are not so many four-sided polygons you can have. Um, if the polygon is null. And um, so you, by, by conformal transformations, you can map that to a standard configuration, which is calculable. But it's not really clear how to construct um, more sides, uh, at least if you want an analytic result. Um, and, and I mean, that, that's basically a hard problem. Um, but you can use integrability to, uh, to Know, construct things abstractly. Um, so the idea basically is that you don't try by force to you know, construct this minimal surface first and then compute its area, but uh, rather use tools of integrability and you use some, inter um, some auxiliary complex parameter, Z, which often you do in uh, integral systems um, and maybe, well, we don't really have an example of that yet, but um, but then you can study the behavior um, on this complex parameter z as a uh, you know, complex analytic function, um, and uh, particularly at the boundary and cusp, and that, that turns this whole problem of understanding the area to a problem of complex analysis on some uh, interesting Riemann uh, surfaces. Um, and roughly speaking, how this works is that um, in, in such a complex analysis and complex functional problem, you encode um, the polygon data, um, that is the, the cross ratios uh, in, in this case, because, um, well, I mean, the, the data is encoded modulo conformal transformations, so the relevant data are the cross ratios. and there's a certain way to extract from, from a certain, say, Riemann surface um, these uh, cross ratios. But if you look at this Riemann surface in a different way, maybe expand it around a certain point, um, you will get also the minimal surface area. That's somehow um, a standard problem in or a standard application of integrable tools. Um, you have some complex analysis problem. And if you look at certain data of, of that, you'll extract um, particular data of, of the real physics problem. And if you do a, nif a different expansion here, you get uh, other relevant data such as minimal surface area or in other problems, say the energy of a given state. And um, the <coughs> interesting point here is that complex analysis relates these various different uh, quantities in a, in a non-direct way. It's just functional analysis. If you say know the expansion at one point, uh, to a certain degree, you can reconstruct the function, and then you can ext extract, um, then you can expand the function around a different point and extract different type of data. And that will then, for example, give you for one point the polygonal data, and for the other point, say, the surface area. And it's not immediately clear why that is so, but um, by, by just using the tools of integrability, you can extract this data from such a curve, and that shows that if something like that works. I mean, this is, this is just very sketchy, but I'm, I'm just trying to give you an overview of various applications of integrability. 
Um, so <coughs> that's how you can do it in principle. But um, if you have polygonal Wilson loops, how how can you do this in somewhat more practical terms? Um, so this is this polygonal Wilson loop, and um, well, it has many cross ratios because there are many many of these uh, corners um, where, in principle, you can uh, adjust how the polygon goes. But um, a practical way is to actually divide this um, this area and introduce new virtual lines, and then try to compute so say the area of each of these patches, and then add these patches together. Um, it looks as if you just have all uh, divided it into quadrangles. Um, the problem is this quadrangle is not, not an ordinary Wilson loop because this line here, for example, is not on the boundary. It's only those external lines that are on the boundary, and you don't quite understand what happens for these intermediate lines. Um, ah, well, these are, these are null lines, so there's a certain way in which you can uh, design these lines. You just start on one vertex here, and you just draw a null line that extends to the other side and meets, um, meets this line. Um, I believe there is, a, there is a unique answer for that. And then you continue um, and always draw, draw these in a certain pattern. Um, well, yeah, if, if I subdivide like that, yes, yeah. But it's not, I mean, only two, of, only two um, opposite lines are on the boundary, and so you understand them well, but you don't quite understand, say, for, for this middle piece, what's here and what's there. And, yeah. Free theory, uh, field theory. Yeah. Uh, uh, for the Wilson loop, yes, yes, yes. I mean, you do get divergences. Well, that's 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 a good good question, and I don't really have a good answer. It's just you do what everyone else does. Um, uh, no, I, I haven't done many of these calculations myself, so I haven't really studied what everyone else does precisely. But, um, but at least you know, for for these lines and uh, for for a cusp, you can. Well, I mean, even if you do it say perturbatively and you have, you stretch a line between this point and that point, this will actually be a null distance. So if you have a propagator on a null distance, that that itself is a problem. But you declare all propagators on a certain straight Wilson null line uh, to sum up to zero. I mean, because also the numerator turns out to be zero. You don't really know what the result is, so you can regularize it away. And then, uh, then there is a certain prescription for, for a corner. The actual interesting con contributions are between two lines which are not adjacent. You know, this line and that line, um, the correlator between those two lines, that, that will be meaningful. But uh, whenever you have a line and you correlate it with a line which intersects it at a null cusp, you are, you are in a tricky situation. And there is a standard answer for that. And uh, you basically use that. But, I mean, it's, it's not an easy problem. On, on the other, I mean, even, even for ADS, um, for, for, the, for, the, for the area problem, there is an analogous problem because uh, the area is supposedly infinite. It stretches all the way to the boundary, and you have to regularize that. And I believe you, you would put a surface in, in a Poincaré uh, coordinates, you would put some surface which is, which is just offset from the boundary by a certain amount, and then there's a certain way to regularize that. And that indeed would be the right, uh, that would be, I think, what people do in this case. Um, you regularize the area in this way and, and then attach a certain answer to that while you shift the, the strain to, to the boundary. Now, um, so somehow uh, you, you can then um, consider each, each of these uh, quadrangles as a certain eigenstate 
And since this, this, this first eigenstate here sits um, on the boundary, this will be a certain yeah, a, a ground state or vacuum state, um, whereas the other ones in the middle are somehow excited states. And these lines here, in some sense, carry transitions between those states. Um, the thing is, here you have this ground state, but in, in these you, you have excited states and you don't quite know what they are. In, in principle, if you want to do, if you want to understand this, you would have to find a whole transition from this state to that state. And um, via these intermediate states, and you would sum over all possible intermediate states. That's somehow um, the resulting expression, say, for the area would be something of this kind where um, you take the overlap sort of for this line, and then you propagate this, this state one. Ah, okay. So you propagate this state one from here to there. Then you take the overlap between state one and two to go into that region and propagate it to there. And so you get sort of a whole propagation from here to all the way to there. And the nice thing is that this propagator from here to there can be done because it's, it's, it's just this regular quadrangle with, with, with nothing bad happening or something prescribed happening at the boundaries. Um, and that, that's... Yeah. Well, there, there's a certain way of describing this thing in terms of states. And since you know what, 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 with what you start with here, namely you start at the boundary, you, you will call this a ground state, or this, is, this has a very well prescribed. Um, um, I, I don't know. First of all, this, this is all the string theory calculation because at the end of the day, you're interested in the area of, of the surface. Um, and uh, then what, I, I'm not precisely sure what th this state is. Um, yeah. Uh, it is, it is, it is. Yeah, therefore you know. I mean, basically, if, if this line was also on the boundary, you would know the answer because that's, that's just uh, the same. That's by conformal transformation. That's the, the only result you can have. Um, but since you have something else here, you, you basically describe this um, by, by this transition or by the new state here. And you want to find out how to get from here to there and then from there to there and so on. Um, this is admittedly sketchy, but um, just wanted to give you an overview of what techniques are being used. So, um, and, and somehow um, an interesting region in this is, is, is just when you put together two of these uh, patches. Um, so here you have a state K and here you have a state K plus one. And some excitations flow in, into this by, from, from the previous um, patches. And then, um, uh, yeah, okay, so, okay, this is, this state here is, is the Fox state of excitation. So it's sort of the states um, that are described by the multipart. These are the multiparticle states that I described earlier where, where you had um, the spin chain and the, these are sort of excitations of the string. And, um, and you have to, in principle, sum over the whole Fox space of excitations. Um, but the nice thing is that each patch in, in, in that sense is integrable and you know that um, these excitations will just propagate from here to there, but whenever they cross, there will be an S matrix. However, at such, uh, at a, such a transition here, you, I guess you change the basis and, and then you go to the next patch with a different basis because the boundary conditions here have, have changed. But in all of these, the world sheet S matrix plays an important role. Um, and since you do sums over all these intermediate states, and there are just infinitely many infinite uh, intermediate states, and uh, it's, it's a very complicated problem. However, you can make some progress if you take all of these lines to be uh, almost collinear. 
And then you can expand around that. And if all of these lines are almost collinear, then there's not much of a transition. So nothing, nothing bad, hap nothing much bad happens at the transi transition. So in that sense, you can at most maybe only um, create one new excitation at each transition for changing the direction slightly. And that makes the whole problem more tractable because you don't have to sum over infinitely many uh, states, but just, uh, or, or just a, a reduced number of states. You still maybe have to sum over or integrate over intermediate states, but uh, the number of particles that propagate along this thing will then just be uh, finite. And the higher you go in perturbation theory, the more intermediate states you have. Um, yeah. OK. <clears throat> now, there, there is, in fact, also a relation to correlation functions of local operators, uh, in n equals 4 super n mills. Um, one direct way of one very direct uh, comparison is if you look at correlation functions of local operators which are light like separated, at least along a certain ordering, right? If you again uh, take that point n and point n plus one are light like, and point n plus one and n plus two are light like, doesn't mean that n and to n plus two is light like, but um, you have a certain sequence of points which are light like separated. And then such correlation functions behave in a certain way. Um, and you see already that, of course, the configuration is similar to the configuration used in, uh, in, in these Wilson loops or in the dual scattering amplitudes. And uh, one result here is that in such a limit, um, the result becomes more or less um, the, the amplitude squared, uh, the, yeah, the scattering amplitude squared or the Wilson loop squared. Now, why is that? Well, because these um, correlation functions are basically a closed surface, uh, a compact surface with punctures wherever the, um, the local operators sit. But uh, here, the, the, the Wilson loop is just a um, disk. So if you glue together two disks, um, you'll get a sphere, and um, these will, the corners will then serve as, as the punctures. So in that sense, it's, it's reasonable to expect that. Indeed, um, there is a certain relation between those two types. Um, so, so in, indeed, also these correlation functions um, uh, contribute to this duality. But um, more generally, there, there is, of course, the operator product expansion in the, in the CFT. And, um, and that will be interesting uh, to, to compute. So, Perhaps the most um, relevant quantity is a three-point correlator, which serves as the OP structure constant. So in, in, in the gauge theory, you would have three uh, local operators with a certain number of fields, and they get contracted between the various operators. And then there will be uh, some loop contributions in the middle that uh, give you the quantum corrections. And that's, that's again, um, yeah, difficult Feynman, comp uh, Feynman, proper, Feynman diagrams to be computed. Um, but a principle can be done. And from that, you can read off the OPE cons uh, structure constants. The corresponding uh, picture in, uh, in, in the string theory would be that you have a, um, a sphere as a world sheet, and uh, you insert three, uh, I guess, three vertex operators, and somehow um, in, in this string on a curved target space, this gives a result. Now, here, the, the world sheet should be a, a sphere with three punctures. It shouldn't be a higher genus because we are in the planar limit, although eventually one might also be uh, interested in, in, in those contributions. Okay, um, but yeah, okay. So if you have the uh, OPE coefficients, you can do the usual um, OPE expansion of higher point functions. And so for example, for a four point function, you could uh, say these two are nearby, so they will be uh, given by a sum over local operators, and then that will be a three-point function. So essentially, you can compute the four-point function as the sum over all intermediate operators propagating between these two pairs of operators. And the corresponding picture in, in, uh, in, in, on the string worksheet is that you have, again, a sphere with four, um, four of these vertex operators inserted. But um, you could view the sphere, you could sort of cut it in two parts, and um, 
this will then be, uh, well, when you cut it apart, then, then you basically cut a new operator in the middle. Um, and if you want the general result, of course, um, you would have to sum over all possibilities that sit there, and that gives you exactly the same picture as from the CFT point of view. Well, if you do that, that probably doesn't help you too much because the three-point function is completely determined by conformal symmetry. So um, if you know the OPE coefficient, it will behave as, as you know, however the CFT will tell you. Um, here it might be a little bit more interesting because if these two are light-like separated, then maybe something interesting happens for the intermediate one. But uh, these two things are not, not directly related. I think they have computed, but I... Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, those things are well known since at least 20 years, and... Um, but I, I, I'm not aware how, how deep um, the comparison goes. Um, so, then, of course, uh, as, as you say, we want to use in methods of integrability to compute correlation functions efficiently, and I've just drawn you a, a four-point function, maybe with one handle um, to make things more complicated. The trouble is that if you want to use integrability, all the methods that I've, well, sketched so far um, apply to much trivial, trivial, more trivial topologies, namely the disk, as for scattering amplitudes and the Wilson uh, loop. Or maybe uh, an annulus, where which would most directly apply to the spectral problem, perhaps. So there you have tools um, which work very well, but nothing in integrable systems really uh, tells you about that. Um, however, uh, we can start simple, and we could take two of these uh, uh, disks and maybe put them in the in the shape of a hexagon and um, stitch them together in a particular way. So, I mean, just take this hexagon and maybe draw it like that and then take another copy and make it uh, this, this, the same shape and glue it together along these, these, uh, these lines. And then you get a pair of pants from, from it. Um, just have to realize that it's, uh, well, it's, it, it's a smooth pair of pants, but it actually has these uh, three uh, lines where, where, where it decomposes into two hexagons. And um, let me see, where will I go from here? And, and the point is that you can basically use integrability to uh, understand each, each of these patches. Um, and as before, you just have to glue them together and you would glue it together by, again, making a sum over all possible states that you can have either the states in here or the states that sit on the boundary. So that means um, it will not be a simple problem because you will have to do, I mean, if you want to glue together things, you will have to sum over intermediate states, infinitely many of them, and that uh, can be done in practice only if you are in special situation or if you do certain expansions, uh, but sometimes you can make progress with that. Now, if you have a pair of pens, of course, you can uh, draw more complicated surfaces, such as this one, for example, here. Um, you would just cut it in, in a certain way that you have se several pairs of pants. And so, at the end of the day, this is just a, a, a big collection of hexagons um, that you glue, glue together in a certain way. Um, and as I said, uh, that there will be certain excited states which you have to sum over, and these excitations are the excitations that I mentioned earlier. Um, which can propagate on the world sheet and which, scat which scatter, and therefore the, 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 the scattering matrix uh, is, a, is an essential ingredient in the whole picture. And then if you, if you know in principle how, how to do that, um, you can glue together, you, you, can do, um, you, know, you can do perturbation theory, you can add cor corrections. So the first, the leading contribution is the connected planar diagram, which is already one over n squared, and then you add handles to this surface, one over n 
the fourth for one handle or one over n to the sixth for two handles. And that um, basically gives you an alternative expansion scheme for this ADS-CFT pair of models. So if you go again back to this parameter space, here um, was uh, the classical gauge theory. And if you do um, standard perturbation theory, you expand in G young mills. And so you, um, you use Feynman diagrams and loops and go from this side towards the middle of the diagram. Uh, and this scheme here basically uh, suggests something else, namely that you start um, with the, the, the planar limit uh, in which you can use integrability to obtain results. And then um, you add such one over n corrections uh, so that you can approach the middle of the diagram, but from this direction. Um, but you know, if if you if you're familiar with string perturbation theory and uh, higher genus uh, contributions, you will know that this expansion is is actually much more complicated than the loop expansion and gauge theory. So um, th this is more a matter of principle that you can can start here and go towards the middle of the diagram. And in some selected situations, you can make progress, but um, yeah, it's it's still actually a rather difficult problem. And let me just show you uh, this for, actually for this uh, kind of four-point correlator. Um, so you could just try to do um, uh, four BPS operators in gauge theory, something like trace phi to the n um, four times um, with different orientations of the scalar um, and maybe different numbers of scalars at each of the four points. And then the planar contributions, roughly speaking, look like that. So you, um, the, each of these is, is one of the BPS operators. And it connects to the neighboring one by either by a single propagator or by several propagators. Um, and if you're, if you're interested in the planar limit, you have to make sure that none of these lines actually cross. And uh, they don't cross if they, I mean, uh, if they're not supposed to cross, then all of the lines have to run in parallel, basically. Um, so that gives you these diagrams, but it also gives you a decomposition in terms of hexagons, as you can see. So, um, uh, so this, this looks like a triangle, but if you also consider this part of the operator as, as, as one corner, uh, as, as a certain small uh, edge of the hexagon, then this, each of these patches is a hexagon. And then this picture gives you a decomposition into hexagons. Um, the trouble is that there are so many ways of doing that, even for basically the simplest thing you could possibly consider. Um, so for example, you, well, you can connect one, two, three, one, two, three, four in, 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 in this square, and then you can add a few more extra lines without violating planarity. But once you are here, that you can actually draw no further lines. Um, and then you have to sum over all line widths and so on. So these would be the moduli of, of your surface. Um, and, uh, there, and then there are different decompositions. And you can also decide to uh, remove some of these lines. It could be that there are no extra lines stretching between two and four on the outside here. Um, and then you get this one. Or you could just uh, have a certain configuration where you need to contract them only in this way. And these all have to contribute. And since you know, you if you remove a line, um, somehow the decomposition is a different one, and you have to sum over all of them. Um, you know, in in some sense, these correspond. If, if you look at the moduli space of such uh, surfaces, these then correspond to certain singular points uh, on the boundary where where you patch different moduli spaces together to form the whole integral over everything. That's just the planar contribution, roughly speaking, corresponding to this. And then um, people have considered, uh, well, for a somewhat more specific one, um, what would be the torus contribution. Now, this configuration here is different because I use only two scalars, um, phi and phi bar, um, which contract to each other, but phi does not contract to phi. Um, and that removes certain possibilities. For example, uh, because phi does not contract to phi, there will be no line from one to three. 
So basically, this square, this, this square here is the only contribution in the planar case. <coughs> so again, you reduce the complexity somewhat. But um, if you if you do that, do it on a torus, then you can draw many more lines. And um, for example, if you remove one of these, you can draw different lines. And these are all different, uh, yeah, diff different. Um, maximal decompositions into, well, here these are octagons. Um, this particular configuration leads to mostly octagons. But, in, but yeah, you can basically use the same techniques of integrability. Okay. Um, well, in gauge theory, these would be weak contractions. If you, uh, however, if you then do perturbation theory, you can have gluons stretching between lines, and then it becomes more complicated. In the integrable setup, these, this would be rather um, the decomposition into, into these patches. And on each patch, uh, you can then have um, excitations running. And they, roughly speaking, correspond to gluons, uh, which you insert in, in the perturbative setup. Now, the problem is that these excitations, I mean, you again have to sum over all possible, uh, over all Fox spaces uh, for, for each of these. Uh, regions, and uh, so excitations run from one patch to, to, the, to the next one, and for crossing these uh, boundaries, you get certain uh, transition factors, and these factors can, under some um, conditions, you can suppress them. And only if you suppress them, you, you have a chance of actually performing the sums that you need. So, um, and, and, you know, then this corresponds roughly if you say the suppression is order g squared, then this would be a perturbative expansion in the gauge theory setup. And then roughly speaking, you could say these excitations are somewhat like the gluons. And so you get something which is similar to the Feynman diagram <coughs> expansion. But on the other hand, it's, it's a rather geometric way of approaching, or combinatorial geometric way of approaching the problem. Um, um, but as you see, uh, even, even the genus one contribution is very hard. Um, and even sometimes the width of these cuts here is relevant. Um, so it can be, I mean, if you have many lines, many propagator lines here um, between two, that something cannot easily cross. But if, if it gets rather thin, maybe there's just one propagator between the two then it's easier for something to go through, and that, that has then some impact. Um, anyway, so that, that, that was one way, one way progress is being made using integrable systems. Um, let me mention a few other directions. So uh, it, people are acti actively looking at different models which are integrable. Maybe the most famous one is N equals six Chern Simons theory or ABJM theory. Um, which is dual strings on ADS4 cross CP3. That's in some sense a very similar model to N equals 4 super young mills. It lives in three dimensions. It has some extra complications, but roughly speaking, uh, many things work in the same way. Um, then you can go one uh, dimension further down and look at strings on ADS3 um, times S3 and times another four-dimensional space, which is either S3 cross S1 or another four-dimensional torus. And um, that should be dual to a two-dimensional CFT. And in 2D CFT, you, of course, have very nice methods um, where you don't even have to have a Lagrangian. And um, a priori, it, it, it was not so clear what these CFTs are precisely that correspond to these models. but. Um, good amount of progress has been made, I think also uh, locally. So, um, yeah, um, so integrability methods are being developed for those um, and they can also help you to understand what's going on in the CFT. A uh, different direction is to deform the integrable structures. Um, a standard deformation in integrable systems is the so-called Q deformation. Um, that gives you one global deformation parameter to most integrable systems, which is called Q. Um, and in principle, you could apply that to uh, to uh, to well to the ADS CFT integrable system. And in that way, you would either get some Q deformation of n equals four super young mills, and I, I don't think anyone has ever 
uh, found out what that is. But, um, but you can do a Q deformation to the string sigma model, and then you'll find that the string background or the background um, space is somewhat deformed in a certain way. And there are two deformations, which I'll just introduce in a second. Um, there are also other deformations which are sort of less severe. They are twist deformations, or you could also do some orbifold models, which also lead to integrable systems. And these are also well known in the context of the corresponding gauge theories or string backgrounds. Um, and, and they are actually, well, they, they are under good control, but you can use them actually to create a, a new type of uh, gauge theory, the so-called fishnet models. So it's not, not actually a gauge theory, but um, a quantum field theory, um, which has very simple Feynman diagrams. So let me um, yeah, elaborate on these two points a bit more. So as I said, many integrable models have integrable deformations. And uh, for example, the Q deformation deforms this Youngian that I already mentioned to a slightly richer class of uh, quantum algebras, so-called quantum affine algebras. These are the standard uh, affine Katz-Moody algebras with some quantum deformation on it. And indeed, uh, for the S-matrix that, that I mentioned, or the S-matrix on the world sheet, there is such a Q deformation. So the question was whether we can Q deform ADS CFT. And indeed, um, some years ago, uh, a, uh, a deformation of the string sigma model action was proposed. So it's, it's a usual co-set sigma model action where you have here G inverse DG and, and G inverse G, DG. Um, and in the middle, usually there would just be the projection that, that selects the right co-set components. But you can somehow deform this um, using a, a classical R matrix. Um, and uh, this allows you to introduce a deformation parameter, and that actually deforms the model in a certain way. There's also a different type of deformation um, for the different gauged West Amino Witten model, which you could also use. Um, and uh, anyway, some issues that came up in, in this investigation is um, how are these two types of deformations actually related? Are they the same? Are they different? Um, how can you map one to the other? Um, and maybe, yeah, one question you should certainly address is uh, whether these uh, models are actually correspond to supergravity backgrounds. Is this deformation still a cos, uh, yeah, a cos, uh, the nonlinear sigma model on a deformed coset, uh, which is a supergravity background? Um, so you have to check a few things there. Um, and thus, is, is this model that, that, that's given here, is that actually a string theory? A lot of work has been devoted to that. And I think now um, it's under quite good control that uh, for most of these, there, there is actually a, a string background or some understanding of what it is. I mean, for example, you, you will need that certain degrees of freedom drop out from the action that, that you have um, conformal symmetry or more more generally diffeomorphism symmetry and supersymmetry. Um, these things are not automatic. But, ah, but, but, but all of these deformations, maybe I didn't point that out, all of these deformations uh, should be, or were, were, were designed to be integrable. Of course, you can devise many types of deformations which are not integrable, but then you'll leave my, uh, my talk for today. Um, Yes, beta deform. These are these are more the twist deformations, um, and those are deformations that exist for integrable systems. Um, I think they are called, uh, in, in a more general setting, they are called Rinfeld twists, um, and sometimes they are also called uh, Rajatikin twists. Um, oh yes, they break all stay. Well, what they usually do is they break. Um, UN or any any Lie group to its Cartan subalgebra. So not much remains. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't say that. It's not. I mean, you deform the symmetry. It doesn't mean it's gone. It's just uh, it's just changed. It's still there, but. Um, uh, it's 
I mean, the U1s, they are manifestly there, the rest of the symmetry. As for the beta deformation, it's, it's not that you kill the symmetry, it's just that most states are not manifestly invariant under it or transform nicely under it. Okay, let me uh, consider scattering amplitudes. Um, so, <coughs> uh, yeah. Um, so what progress has been made in scattering amplitudes uh, or how, how did integrability contribute to that? Well, um, when you construct, when you do higher loop uh, scattering amplitudes these days, you often construct them, you find a certain basis of um, functions that you can use and then you match the coefficients and, uh, and that, that will then give you the result um, based on, you know, you need certain input and you can use uh, integrability to provide you that input or some of that input. So for example, um, the functions, the, the functional blocks that you use for amplitudes, you could say these should be Youngian invariant, um, so that would give you constraints. Or I guess uh, it was shown that tree level amplitudes are Youngian invariant, and therefore if you patch them together in a certain way, you will preserve this Youngian symmetry. And um, also, um, yeah, uh, the loop integrals um, you can obtain from these null polygonal Wilson loops um, uh, by means of the duality between Wilson loops and uh, scattering amplitudes. And uh, you could use, uh, for example, some of these uh, patching techniques to provide some answers, for example, here. Some of these, um, some coefficients and some limits can be calculated through these methods and they can then be matched to give you the right coefficients um, for a construction of amplitudes. Um, so you can make progress using that. Um, you can even apply this to form factors, which is a certain generalization uh, of scattering amplitudes or some certain mix between scattering amplitudes and local operators. Um, so let me let me just uh, sketch you to you what the symmetry is here or how yeah this Youngian symmetry applies. Um, Youngian symmetry first of all contains the ordinary space-time symmetries, which are the conformal or more generally superconformal symmetries. And if you have such a scattering amplitude. Um, the easiest way to, to understand the symmetry is in terms of the ward identity. So a, a free way of expressing this ward identity is to say you have the scattering amplitude and you transform one leg, say leg K, uh, with the symmetry um, or with the symmetry variation of this kind. We call the symmetries J and C would be an index uh, running over all the possible symmetries that you have. And you sum over all um, sides k in uh, uh, just some over them and the whole result would be zero. That's, that's how the symmetry acts on the scattering amplitude and if the amplitude is invariant then the variation should be zero. Um, now there's also for, for the Youngian there's a similar type of relation except that you now have to pick a pair of legs, uh, say label them by k and j, and apply a conformal transformation to each leg, uh, maybe JA and JB, and you would now sum over all these pairs, but you also contract um, well, these with the structure constant. Actually, it should be FCAB. Um, so you, you contract these two with the structure constant, and then you get a third index, and that would be the index of, of that level one symmetry. And that, that's a new type of relationship for, uh, for the scattering amplitude. Um, and indeed, uh, it was shown for tree level amplitude that these, these, are, these two identities are actually satisfied. And so you can then use such things, uh, such tree amplitudes in, uh, as building blocks in the generalized unitarity approach, for example. This one, why? I mean, the, the simplest thing, the simplest thing uh, 
in conformal symmetry, you have translation symmetry. Translation symmetry is generated by, by the momentum generator. So what you would do is, uh, so, so this generator would multiply each leg by the corresponding momentum. Now, if you sum over all momenta, it's zero. Um, you can do the same for rotations. If you rotate each of these um, external legs, which means rotating both the momentum and also the spin, uh, and sum over all legs, that gives you zero. That's how water identities work. What do you mean this one? Yes, you would have that too, but the point is that um, this could be written as a commutator of two such things. So you don't need to do all that. Um, this would follow automatically. It's, uh, but but uh, yeah, I mean that's uh, yeah. This is this mostly applies at tree level because um, here I just um, use the free representation of the symmetries, which just acts on the Fox space in a linear fashion. Um, or on, e on, on an n-particle state in Fox space, it just transforms each particle individually. Um, the trouble is that loops have divergences. If you have loops somewhere here, divergences you need to regularize. Once you regularize, the symmetries don't quite apply anymore, and you have to, well, you don't, you're not quite sure what, what the result is. Um, and it's not so easy because these are both UV and IR divergences. Um, there's, in fact, another issue which we came across. These are collinear singularities, and uh, I think it's quite instructive. Even at tree level, the result that I mentioned here does not quite hold because um, these external lines, um, they can be collinear. If, if they become collinear, the scattering amplitude has typically a pole of a certain well-prescribed form. And the point is that some of these conformal symmetries will, will see those poles. It's like um, d, z, d by dz sees a pole of 1 over d, uh, 1 over z bar, actually, uh, and produces a delta function. And this very same relation can be applied here. And you see that, actually, um, this, this result for tree-level amplitudes um, is, uh, is zero unless two of the external legs become collinear. Then you get delta function contributions. Uh, the nice thing is you can somehow change the symmetry representation in a certain way um, such that it produces collinear output and uh, cancel this, this uh, leftover piece with it so that indeed uh, tree-level amplitudes are exactly zero um, that, that can be shown. And the same also applies for these Youngian ward identities because each of these will behave uh, if you let each of these behave like that. Um, <clears throat> however, the issue is somehow worse at loop order um, because, uh, well, suppose you do, do this with a, some loop amplitude and also this, then uh, this may remove some of the collinear divergences, but it's also natural to, to add such a contribution where these two... Um, lines here attached to, to the scattering amplitude. And if you just look, uh, count the number of loops, this would be one loop order lower, because here you close one loop. However, the problem is that each of these are uh, divergent, and also this introduces some additional divergences, in particular because all of these particles are on-shell and massless, and massless particles are not so easy to deal with. So it's not re really very clear how to do how to resolve such divergences. Um, so we don't really know from this picture in, in what sense Young in, the Youngian is actually a symmetry. A conformal symmetry may be easier, um, but, but even there it's not very clear. Um, uh, well, the, the, their Youngian is not really known well as a, as a symmetry of any quantum field theory. Um, there are certain quantum mechanical models where you have Youngian symmetry. Um, there it can be, can be taken as exact. 
Yes, but the problem is a bit that um, these models work in a very different way. So, you know, even if you understand it there, it doesn't quite help you here, I, I, would, I would argue, but I um, don't know. Um, nevertheless, uh, some differential equations have been proposed for scattering amplitudes, um, which have certain origin in the Youngian, and they seem to be useful. But uh, yeah, it would be good to understand how, how to derive such things from first principles. Um, one useful representation uh, for scattering amplitudes that has been used quite a lot are uh, on-shell diagrams. Um, this is uh, a diagram where the internal lines here are not off-shell as usual, but they are also on-shell. And that makes, makes it somehow more, well, accessible to, uh, to group theory methods. And well, so you only need for on-shell diagrams two types of vertices. It's, it's sort of the MHV and MHV bar vertex at, at three points. And from that, you can construct uh, very neat bigger diagrams. Um, these have been used in Twister and Grossmannian geometry and in relation to the amplitude-hedron. Um, as I said, all of the lines are on shell. Um, there are only three, there are only two interaction vertices. And roughly speaking, um, you can understand it in a, such a way that uh, you need four of these on shell loops um, for each off shell loop. So if you want to reproduce the behavior, the, the, the analytic behavior of a scattering amplitude, with n loops, then roughly speaking, in these on-shell diagrams, you need a diagram with four n loops. It's just uh, if you consider how, yeah, uh, how many degrees of freedom are left by performing such integrals. But once that is done, um, you, you can sort of reproduce the, the dependence on the external momenta um, by, by such uh, on-shell diagrams. Um, you also need external, you need extra on-shell loops uh, if you have more than three legs. So uh, this diagram here has four legs, so this one loop actually just takes into account that you have a tree-level diagram. This is again just a tree-level diagram, whereas some of these are, this is perhaps an actual loop because it has one, two, three, four, five um, faces, uh, which is four for the loop and one for the fourth leg. Um, Um, as I said, the benefits of this picture are that, that it's somehow algebraically more accessible because you understand how each of these things uh, transforms and you can act on the internal lines because they are on-shell legs. You can also say, rather argue manifestly, that these are all young and invariants. Um, caveat is that the integrals still have divergences. I mean, maybe not all of them, but some of them do have. And then, in principle, you need to regularize. And once you regularize, you lose most of your beauty. And uh, it's, uh, you are still not quite sure in what sense the Youngian will be a symmetry. It's, it's not, no, nice, though, that if you don't care about divergences, then at least formally it appears that Youngian symmetry just goes through. Now, <clears throat> another direction of recent study is the fishnet model. Um, where you use this beta deformation, this TST type deformation. Yes, sorry. Uh, yes, one can, but uh, no, you just have to wait to the end of today. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> uh, if I had given this talk uh, like 10 years ago, I wouldn't have said so, but it's becoming clear. Um, Okay, uh, yeah, okay, there's, the, there, there's a certain um, way of using the, uh, this beta deformation uh, where you don't take a real beta parameter but an imaginary beta uh, parameter, which supposedly still leaves the integral structure intact, but once you take beta to be imaginary, it's not a unitary uh, thing, you, you violate unitarity. Um, so you have an integrable but non-unitary model, and you can do an extreme case where you sort of pull this beta to a i infinity or something to, um, to actually suppress some of the interactions. 
And if you do this in a clever way, um, you'll end up with a model where um, most of uh, the interactions drop out. And there's a certain sector of two scalar fields, two complex scalars, phi 1 and phi 2, um, which just have uh, the usual kinetic terms for complex scalars and one interaction term, which is phi to the fourth. But remember, these are still n by n matrices, so a certain ordering of the field applies. And um, curiously, this is, uh, yeah, th this term is present in the action, but its complex conjugate term is not present because it's suppressed by something like where you usually have e to the i beta, and you take beta to go to infi uh, i infinity, that will, ta will take this term to zero. Whereas this term somehow survives the procedure. And thus, you get very simple Feynman rules. Um, so you get two types of lines, and then you just use them by solid and dashed lines. Pick them by solid and dashed lines. And then here, um, there's an interaction between those two lines. But importantly, um, and if you draw this in a planar fashion, then the opposite uh, crossing is not allowed. It's, it's something that is not there. Well, what's the, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what's the motivation? Pe people, yeah, I mean, integrable people like integrability. Um, and they would usually care about unitarity, but uh, depends on your level of desperateness. Uh, you, you might just say, okay, let's forget about unitarity. I just want an integral model. And if you get something like that out, um, that, that is very surprising. Um, it's a toy, I think the motivation is um, you want to have a toy model. I'm not sure what actually was the motivation to go that way. But once you know that the result is nice, um, that would be a good motivation. Um, and so, in particular, if you go to the planar limit again, um, then if you have two lines which cross point, uh, the is not there, um, they will never be allowed to cross back. And that, that really severely restricts the Feynman diagrams. And if you look at correlation functions of some external points, say, this would be the simplest one, and there, there is this one configuration where you just have a single cross, and that's, that's a diagram which is easy. If you have more external lines, you could, for example, draw this diagram, and then you could assemble some of these rungs together. And this is why it's called fishnet, because you, you add more and more, and then you get some net. I, I don't know, actually know where the fish is, but um, uh, yeah, you can draw some nets. But you can also draw more complicated things. Maybe one claim to fame of this theory is that there is uh, just a, for each configuration of external um, lines, there is a unique planar graph, which can be a tree-level graph or maybe a loop graph um, or maybe a graph of this kind. And um, at least that's the claim. I, whenever I hear the claim, I try to ask, is, is that true? And then the answer is yes, of course it's true. And then I say why it's true. And then uh, don't get an answer. But a few days later I get, well, because you can construct it in this way. And then I sit together with the person for two hours and try to understand whether that's true. And then usually it's not true because it doesn't. So on the other hand, I, I, I do believe in it. I, I just don't know why. And I think it's a nice combinatorial problem. Um, of understanding if you give some external configuration of lines, can you show that uh, there's just a, a unique way of contracting it? Uh, there may be no, no way of contracting it in the planar fashion, but uh, there's supposedly not more than one. But anyway, um, that, that's a side remark. Um, it's the, the nice thing about all of these graphs is that they, they are finite. Um, and because this vertex here is, is phi to the fourth, is conformal invariant. So all of these graphs are manifestly conformal invariant and finite. There's a Youngian symmetry uh, where you sort of look at the external legs. You go once around the diagram and apply two generators in a certain way. You can show that all of these graphs are actually Youngian invariant in a certain way. There, there, there is something extra. I mean, it's as compared to the n equals four case, 
you need to do something extra um, with shifting some of the lines. It has to do with the fact that here you are in a conformal, not in a super conformal theory. Um, but uh, yeah, that has been understood. Um, and uh, but but all of these considerations, I mean, the Feynman diagrams look simple, but these are position space Feynman Feynman graphs. And for example, this one is uh, this cross is actually if you dualize it to a momentum space, this corresponds to the one loop box, and this one corresponds to the two loop massive box, and that is already a very complicated function which is not yet under good control. Um, this is expressed in terms of dialog functions. This would be uh, some polylogs, but not of the ordinary type, but, but more of the elliptic polylog type. I don't know. Um, this is something which is actively being discussed. Um, so almost getting to the final. What's the time anyway? Ah, 20 to 1? Good. OK. Um, so um, another type of observable uh, is, is the Wilson loop. Um, so we've already encountered Wilson loops on null polygons, but as I said, um, well, there are some divergences for null because because you have null lines and because they intersect at angles that that causes some problems. Uh, same for the scattering amplitudes with the IR divergences, but you can look at different, uh, more general Wilson loops where where the path you choose is just. Uh, a generic smooth path which does not self-intersect and which does, uh, I think that's, that's the main thing. It shouldn't self-intersect, it should be smooth. Um, and indeed, um, if you choose uh, a path in 10 dimensions, um, which is null in 10 dimensions, then you get the so-called Maldasena-Wilson loop. And um, this is nice because uh, it has no divergence sitting on, on the path, um, basically because the path itself is, is null in a certain sense. Um, and thus, well, this, this is a perfectly finite uh, observable. So you can compute its expectation value for a given path. Now, you have this uh, finite observable and uh, in the planar limit, it has just the topology of a disk. And so methods of integrability should apply. And in particular, you should find that the expectation value is invariant. Now, <clears throat> how do you transform such an object? If you, use, if you apply conformal transformations, basically it will just transform the path according to this conformal transformation. But if you look at a small transformation, you can also write it in a different way. Namely, you apply this small transformation to each uh, tiny uh, piece of the Wilson line and you shift it in the appropriate direction by a tiny bit. And that's uh, by inserting a certain operator, can be achieved by inserting a certain operator, which I'll just call J uh, acting on A. A is, is the piece of the Wilson loop and J is how it shifts it. And altogether, these two things uh, combine to a field string. So, you want to deform a Wilson line, it's, it's like inserting little pieces of field strength along the line. So, um, so that would be the, the variation of the Wilson loop. And um, there's also a way to define how the Youngian acts on the Wilson loop. And that, that's just in the very same way as before. You have two um, insertions here, and you deform each one in a certain way. Um, with conformal transformations, and then you contract these conformal transformations with the structure constants of the conformal group, and that's how, how the union works. You, again, sum over all pairs, and yeah, that's definition. Which one? Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, if, if you want to do it in 10D, you, you would say this A is the whole thing, yes. Um, although it doesn't matter so much, you can also do it in a strictly four-dimensional setting. But uh, the point is that this scalar field is not so different from the gauge, the gauge field. You could view it in a 10-dimensional perspective, and they are one field. Um, but roughly speaking, this is how, how it works, yeah. <clears throat> 
And you can even supersymmetrize the whole picture. You can define a supersymmetric Wilson loop, and then you have a path in superspace and transform this in superspace. This actually gives a, an even nicer picture. Um, <coughs> so, Youngian invariance now means that these uh, that the Wilson loop um, expectation value is invariant. Um, so the, ver the the expectation value of the variation for conformal symmetries is zero. That is clearly true. But even for this one, it's it's uh, zero. Um, so you can check these uh, these properties in perturbation theory um, at order lambda. At, at the first perturbative order, one loop or order g squared, the Wilson loop expectation value is just given by, um, yeah, by expanding the Wilson loop to two powers of the gauge field, and then they are contracted by a propagator. You sum over all, or you integrate over all pairs of points. And um, now you can do the same. You can, ex you can compute the expectation value of uh, this variations. And here you get where you have... Um, the, the deformation, the deformed point, the, uh, the, the, the uh, deformation insertion contracted to another point. And um, once you integrate this, you'll get zero due to conformal symmetry. And the same is true for Youngian symmetry. Once you integrate, because now you have two deformation points and they are both a field, so you compute the expectation value, it just has to contract the two. And um, again, once you perform these integrals, you'll get zero. Um, so that, roughly speaking, uh, tells you that you get Youngian invariance at the leading order. And uh, tomorrow I'll actually go into some more detail with that. Um, yeah, question is, does this still hold at higher orders? Um, now, finally, um, yeah. So, so what I've told you so far is that um, the implications of this Youngian or of integrability or of Youngian symmetry have been understood for several observables. Um, integrability has been applied to compute certain quantities at finite coupling. Um, if you go to the leading weak coupling order, even the math concepts are under good control. You get quantum algebras, which are understood. Um, the perturbative con corrections are under good control, uh, some of them, not all of them. Um, and also, integrability is, is well understood as a concept in the classical string theory as a two-dimensional uh, yeah, theory where integrability is really at, at home. But one remaining question in this is, what is integrability? Um, in the sense, how can you define it? Um, how can you prove it? If you want to prove it, you first have to define it. And if you don't know what it is precisely, then there's no way of proving it. Um, and as I said, uh, things are under good control at both ends of uh, the strong and weak coupling interpolation, but not so clear at higher loops and not even clear at finite coupling. So if we had some non-perturbative way of defining what we mean by integrability, then um, maybe much of these, much of this progress can be proved or more rigorously de derived. So indeed, now um, the aim, if you have a symmetry, would be to show that the action is invariant under, under such a symmetry. Um, the main question in that is, or has been for a long time, how can you apply this Youngian generator to the action of the model? Um, one point which I always thought was decisive is um, that if the, the action is just a combination of, uh, I mean, in N equals four superang mills is a combination of quadratic, cubic, and quartic terms. Um, there is a trace, but uh, acting on, on the product of matrices, but it's not so clear what is actually meant by a uh, planar part. Um, there's no way of saying, okay, the action, you just pick out the planar part. There would be, say, if you had also double trace contributions, you might throw them away um, and call them non-planar. But but um, but even in in this n equals four action, at the end of the day, you get planar non-planar contributions, and the question is a bit: How can you encode them? And, and what how do you do this for the action? And also for the representation of of conformal and Youngian symmetries. 
it's not so clear which representation you take, free representation, nonlinear terms, as, as I mentioned, there are these nonlinear terms both for scattering amplitudes but also for local operators. Um, certain quantum corrections, do you need to take them into account? It's not so clear how to define that. However, one hint which I think comes clearly from, from this year is that if you have Wilson loops and you do an OPE of Wilson loops um, around a, a point like limit, then at some point you'll find the Lagrangian. So, um, and, and furthermore, um, the Wilson loops are Youngian symmetric, so shouldn't the, uh, the, the Lagrangian be Youngian symmetric in a certain sense? Um, <clears throat> there are also further features of the action that uh, may help. For example, the action is single trace uh, because it contains just a trace of, of uh, product of matrices. Um, the action is, so in that sense, it's, it, it has a disk topology, and disk topology is something where integrability applies best. Um, the action is conformal, um, which is also a feature which you require for certain cyclicity properties of the Youngian, which usually do not apply. So there's, there's you know, this is some essential feature that, that makes it, uh, yeah, makes it some, some problem which, which is non, non, uh, nonsensical. Um, and finally, maybe another hint is that the action is non-renormalized. Um, so it's a finite action, you don't renorm need renormalization, and that may point at the fact that maybe this symmetry does not have anomalies, although it's perhaps a different one, but uh, it's good to see that the action itself is non-divergent, non so that maybe you can avoid some uh, anomalies. I mean, certainly otherwise you would uh, break conformal symmetry, and that would be bad. Um, so here today I only can sketch uh, sketch a bit um, how this symmetry works, and tomorrow I will continue. So, um, however, the problem here is that we can't quite act on the action yet. We have to be careful, but we can do something simpler. We could use the equations of motion of, of the gauge theory. Um, so the, the gauge theory has the Young-Mills equations, it has Dirac equations, and once we apply the symmetry to the equations of motion, uh, we should get back zero. Well, we don't quite have to get back zero. It could just be proportional to the equations of motion because then on shell everything will be zero. And in fact, this, is, this, this, this uh, relationship here would be very essential um, for the quantum formulation because um, usually you set, in the quantum theory, you assume that the equations of motion hold and if you transform the equations of motion and get something which does not go to zero, it would probably not be a symmetry. So we can look at the Dirac equation. Dirac equation is uh, deep psi with a certain slash, uh, which I just used the dot here for. Um, it's a covariant derivative acting on, on the fermion field. And then due to the Yukawa term, there's also a commutator with the scalar field. And if you expand these terms, there's one linear term, there's this just the deep psi term, and then there's a commutator with the gauge field and also a commutator with the scalar field, and these are two quadratic terms uh, for the nonlinear equations of motion. Um, it's clear how to act with conformal symmetry on it, and that does apply. Um, for the Youngian, again, we use these uh, bilocal transformations. So, um, well, this term is linear in the field, so there's nothing much bilocal you could possibly do there. But here there are two fields, and you can act with one symmetry on one generator and with the other symmetry on the other generator. And that's this term here. So JA acts on A and JB acts on Psi. And somehow this symmetry, because it's anti-symmetric in the indices, it does transform this commutator to an anti-commutator for a certain reason. Uh, and this, this gives you one contribution, and then you also act on this term. And uh, well, that's not everything, because there can also be terms which act on a single field. Um, and, but we don't quite know what they are, so just say, well, 
we act on a single field psi and we act on a single field psi bar and you know, on the field A. Um, we just don't know what they are a priori. <clears throat> but the question is, does this equation hold? Do you get zero once you impose the equations of motion? And the nice thing is that for these here, many of the contributions cancel and all the remaining ones can be grouped into terms of this kind. Um, if you make a certain ansatz for, for these uh, unknowns. And once, you, once you've made this ansatz, you can check uh, whether all the other equations hold or whether it holds for different types of generators. And you'll find a, a consistent assignment for, for all of these such that all the equations of motion that you get are indeed symmetric. So the equations of motion for n equals four super mills classically are young and invariant. Um, now, if you have, no, no. I mean, in pure young mills, you would not have this term, or you wouldn't even have the Dirac equation. You, you, could, you could, for example, take n equals one. Um, then you have the Dirac equation. Otherwise, you have to look at the young mills equation, which is a bit more complicated. But the point is that if you have, if you take the young mills equation, then j hat on A, and there's no matter, then this, this has to be zero. There's nothing it could possibly be. And so um, there would be, well, the young mills equation is df equals zero. Now this contains both a linear, a quadratic, and a cubic term, and then you add them up, and you'll just get something which is not zero. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, so, if you have an exact symmetry in a quantum field theory, you get typically you get Ward identities or Ward Takahashi identities, which basically apply perturbatively at all orders. Um, I'm assuming these are nonlinear. Uh, these symmetries are exact nonlinear. If the action is invariant, um, so you need that the action is invariant, and this invariance of the equations of motion follows from it, but it's, it's not sufficient to show that the action is invariant. And uh, there can possibly be a quantum anomalies that destroy the symmetries. Um, so therefore, we would like to show the invariance of the action, but difficulties are that, well, there's some problem with cyclicity, because uh, once you want to act on pairs of fields in an anti-symmetric way, you need a reference point, and you don't know where this reference point is. So you don't know really where to cut the trace open. Um, that shouldn't really make a, shouldn't really be a problem due to uh, conformal symmetry, but uh, practically you still have to make up some prescription how to do it, and uh, that you have to do. And the other problem is nonlinear. So if you want to cut open this trace, um, then there's a problem that you have four diff three different types. You have quadratic, cubic, and quartic terms, and um, they all have to talk to each other in a certain way. So if you cut open, open the trace in different ways for these different lengths, then uh, you don't quite know what you get. Um, <clears throat> however, we, we had already shown that the equations of motion are invariant, and we could uh, yeah, improve this statement and construct uh, this term, j hat acting on s, in a certain way that it actually gives, gives you zero. Um, so we, this, this uh, showing the invariance of the equations of motion helped us come up with some prescription how to do it, how to write this term. Um, and it has some unusual features. For example, the way it acts on the fields depends not just on the field, but also depends on sort of how many fields are within the trace. Um, that's a bit unusual. You have some overlapping bilocal terms where, as I said before, you act on two different um, fields uh, for, say, scattering amplitudes or local operators. Um, now you can also act on the output of, of the other action. Um, and also, um, perhaps worst, is that uh, you break gauge invariance. 
Um, you don't break it. Uh, it's, it's just not manifest. The result is not manifestly gauge invariant. Um, and, and therefore, it's not easy to come up with the result. However, um, we can show that with a certain prescription, the action of n equals 4 is annihilated, whereas if you pick any other gauge theory, like n equals 1 or just Young-Mills or something else, um, this usually does not give 0 because the theory is not integrable. And in that sense, I, I would view this as a proper definition of integrability in the classical model. Um, it's one, so, um, but it's, 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 it's a well-defined um, relation. And uh, once you have this relation, you can try to apply it in the field theory context. Um, once you have food, you could apply that to lunch. But um, let me just finish with uh, two more slides. So um, <coughs> here, uh, yeah, we want to use this relationship uh, to come up with, say, word identities for correlation functions. So you, you can have some correlators of, of fields in, in, in N equals 4, 3, mills. For example, you take the deformations also work, although it's not, I mean, one example has been worked out, but it's not universally understood, but, yeah. ABJM certainly also works, yes. ABJM works, um, yeah. We haven't tried anything like, uh, like uh, Chen Simons, you could try with less supersymmetry and then it should not work for less than six supersymmetries. Um, but, yeah. Um, we haven't done that, but we've certainly checked that ABJM works. Here, um, we are in N equals 4, and we, we can now con consider the correlator of fields. These are, these are individual fields, so these might be gauge fields or scalar fields. And once you compute something like that for three fields, you get a single interaction vertex. For four fields, um, you can see the quartic vertex or two cubic vertex contracted by an internal propagator. Um, and because it's planar, the third diagram of this kind here does not contribute. Um, so Youngian symmetry uh, should imply certain word identities on these correlation functions, just as conformal symmetry does. And uh, conformal symmetry, for example, for a three-point function, you would uh, act on each of these three fields um, individually and sum over them, and the sum of these uh, correlation functions should then be zero, independently of which conformal generator you pick or which of the three fields you pick. Here I just assume these are gauge fields, but you don't have to do that. For the young end, it works again in a similar way. You act on pairs of fields, maybe one and two, two and three, or three and one, um, but you can also act on single fields with, with this J hat generator, which I uh, which I mentioned earlier, and which was defined by the action from the equation of motion. And we've verified that these combinations here actually uh, do give you zero. Um, we haven't done this on concrete functions, but we've done this by using formal transformations. Um, I'll show tomorrow how that works. Um, one generic problem, which we can discard to a certain extent, but should actually take into account is that the, uh, this is a gauge theory and once you quantize it you need to fix a gauge before you can compute any correlation functions. So um, <clears throat> the problem is that uh, if you fix the gauge by say the Fadeyev popov met method um, you introduce new fields, you introduce, uh, you break some of the symmetries, you introduce a new BRST symmetry. The question is how does that fit together with the Youngian symmetry? Um, so we have the ghost fields, we have extra terms in the action, they may spoil Youngian symmetry. Um, and in fact, uh, you get a new concept of BRST cohomology. So most statements that you come up with should not be viewed in a plain way, but rather in a, in a cohomological sense. Um, so how can we, first of all, represent our symmetry on the unphysical fields that we get, on the ghosts, and how can we see that the extra terms don't give you everything, anything new. 
Now for conformist, uh, in conformal symmetry is instructive. Um, <coughs> you just uh, make sure that the residual terms that, that you add in the action are BRST exact. Um, so if you act with the symmetry on the action, you actually uh, act just on the gauge fixing terms because the rest of the action is already invariant. And um, you can, if you can show that this is BRST exact, so it's Q of something, um, then it just means that um, there is something, but it, it does not contribute to anything physical. Um, and basically, th this, is, this is sort of uh, the symmetry statement in the BRST cohomological sense. Um, for the level one symmetry, we find that uh, the transformation of the action, um, well, gives you a term of, of a similar kind, so a BRST exact term, but you actually need two further terms which uh, actually require new concepts to, uh, yeah, to be understood. Um, but then um, even the gauge fixed action um, is gauge is, 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 beer, is, is invariant, young in, the gauge fixed action is young and invariant in a certain extended BRST cohomology. Um, and we've even tested uh, the, the what identities for the gauge fixed, uh, for the gauge fixed correlation functions and they work out nicely. Of course, uh, there are anomalies, uh, I don't want to provoke an anomaly in this room by going much further, but uh, uh, <coughs> the anomaly here is that, well, whether, uh, whether the symmetry survives uh, quantum corrections. Um, the, there are established for methods for dealing with anomalies in quantum field theories. Um, it's not so clear how far they apply because this symmetry is not very usual. Um, it's, it's even in, in a certain sense non-local, uh, whereas the study of quantum anomalies always has to do with locality. So, um, <clears throat> but maybe we can use the, the methods because this uh, non-locality is a bit in color space, not so much in space time. And maybe, well, question is, can we understand anomalies as a violation of non-local current? Well, the non-locality is again a problem. Maybe you can use still some cohomological origin. Um, there are some clues, well, um, Integrability seems to work well at finite lambda, so we don't really expect anomalies, but it would be good to understand this on a more formal level. Um, and for example, it's not an issue for, for the Wilson loop expectation value at the leading order. Maybe that already excludes anomalies, or maybe you have to go further. Uh, we want to go further to, uh, to order lambda squared. Um, if we go to lambda squared, um, then we get ad additional contributions to this invariance condition and well um, in principle we have to sum this up for arbitrary contours. Um, problem is that there are so many diagrams that contribute and so many integrals left to be done uh, which produce boundary terms and you have to in addition regularize the whole thing very carefully to make sense of things. Uh, the conclusions uh, yeah of, of these two talks is well I've spent a long time on reviewing ADS CFT integrability and there's a lot of progress in various in understanding how to apply methods of integrability to various observables and in different slightly different situations and deformed models and fishnet models and final part uh, was uh, and where, where I will continue mostly tomorrow is that we've now established the Youngian algebra as a symmetry of planar classical n equals 4 super Young Mills. Um, I've shown you how to understand it as a symmetry of the equations of motion and of the action. Um, this shows that in, a, in, in this way of defining it that classical planar n equals 4 super Young Mills is integrable and this actually gives rise to certain word identities due to Youngian symmetry. Um, We've also established that the symmetry is compatible with gauge fixing and these, this gauge fixing then actually squares into these uh, identities in a well-defined way. And at the end of the day, we do not expect uh, 
quantum anomalies, but we also want to rule them out more rigorously. So thanks, and uh, see you tomorrow.